Uh, I'm really pleased now to be able to introduce our afternoon speaker, and uh, we're very, very fortunate to have with us Dr. Jonathan Moore. Uh, John is a professor, Lieber Aero Chair of Coastal Science and Management at Simon Fraser University. John leads the Salmon Watersheds Lab that works on ecology and conservation of aquatic systems. And uh, the, the work that John and his lab are doing is really, really impressive. If you haven't had a chance to have a look at their website, I'd really encourage you to check it out. They've done some amazing stuff and they were instrumental in some of the science that informed some of the decisions around the major developments that were proposed in the Skeena Estuary uh, uh, within the last couple of years. So with that, John, welcome. Thank you for joining us and uh, we'll turn the floor over to you. Great. Thanks, Jason. And, and um, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to speak with you all today. It's a wonderful event. And uh, yes, yeah, I really want to thank the speakers for their insights this morning and the great questions that are coming from people around the province and beyond. It's fun to connect with you from afar. Um, and thanks to the Pacific Salmon Foundation in general. It's exciting to see this initiative and to learn more and to sort of be a, a part of the conversation that helps set the stage. So as, uh, as Jason mentioned, uh, my name is Jonathan Moore. I'm a professor at Simon Fraser University. And today what I'll be doing is trying to um, provide a, you know, a bit of a brief overview of some of the thinking that's been going on in our, in our group and um, but about climate change and salmon systems, acknowledging that there's a ton of information on this topic. And so it is a complex topic and we'll only you know, scratch the surface. And the talks today really sort of gave great um, information on other aspects. So I do lead the Salmon Watersheds Lab at SFU and we collaboratively work with diverse partners to try to do science that really informs the conservation and the management of salmon systems. And at SFU it's great to work with other professors like John Reynolds and others as well as DFO folks that are actually on campus there. And um, we work with diverse groups from First Nations to PSF to other groups um, for science for thriving watersheds and thriving watersheds for people and fish. So it's really trying to think about the whole system. So I just wanted to start, start the stage with this sort of broad, you know, idea that's not new, I guess. And that is that, you know, salmon systems are changing and they're going to continue to change. And they're being, you know, modified by these dual pressures human activities in watersheds and coastal areas, as well as climate change. And then collectively, those two pressures are modifying salmon systems. And when I say salmon systems, I really mean a system. I mean, not just salmon. I mean the rivers, I mean the watershed, and I also mean the people. You know, these are places where people live. These are places where we extract resources. And these are places where, you know, cultures evolved. And, you know, on that note, I just wanted to acknowledge that I'm calling in from Deep Cove in North Vancouver, which is in the territory of the Coast Salish peoples. So today what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to cover three topics or touch base on three topics. Um, you know, some of this is going to be um, some ideas that I'm sharing that might be information, you know, might be interesting and fodder for discussion. Um, and others is work by others and some of the is work by our own group. So first of all, I just wanted to um, really just briefly talk about, you know, some of the evidence of climate change impacts in these salmon systems. Then I'll talk about the idea of climate change risks and how we can sort of conceptualize and assess that. And then I'll end by throwing out a bunch of sort of ideas about, you know, the realities, I think, about trying to think about change in these complex connected systems that are people and fish and flows of water and watersheds. And so really trying to think about the systems um, science given oncoming climate change. So as we've heard today, uh, climate change is impacting salmon across their life cycle. And the evidence of this is, um, you know, striking. And I think, you know, it's important to think about as the salmon life cycle unfolds, from you know potentially headwater systems through estuaries to the ocean and back again that life cycle is integrating across the different sort of manifestations of climate change and there's a variety of these and so i won't try to talk in depth about each one of these but climate change is going to be changing the amount and the quality of the aquatic habitats that might be available for salmon areas might be getting too warm 
or some areas that are cold actually might be getting um, you know, better for growth. And so those warming waters can pose real risks in some areas. And in years when the Fraser River is hot, for example, uh, you know, a lot of fish die, a lot of sockeye die from some populations on their way upstream because of that hot water. Another symptom of climate change are changing flow regimes. And these changing flow regimes are one of those master variables that really define freshwater systems. From the ocean side, sea level rise is um, you know, happening and, and that will modify estuaries. As those salmon migrate out to the ocean, they're also gonna be encountering altered food webs altered environmental conditions in that near shore and beyond. And the timing, for example, of when their food might be available is going to be changing as oceans warm. Ocean heat waves are happening. And, you know, these changes in the marine environment are having perhaps unpredictable effects on things that we're only starting to understand. And this last point is um, crunchies to squishies. And that's a term that sort of resonated with me. And, and that is the idea that as in, in years when the ocean warms, uh, the food web might change so it's not as beneficial from more gelatinous zooplankton toward, sorry, the reverse. It, when the ocean is warmer, it'll be more gelatinous, more jellyfish type of thing. But when the ocean is cooler, it'll be more of the tasty, nutrient-rich, crunchy food web basis. So these are all these complex manifestations of climate change that are happening now and will be happening in the future. And the symptoms of these are the sort of responses of salmon are going to be multifold as well. And so salmon will change in population abundance and productivity. But it's not just going to be their abundance that shows climate change. It's also going to be their life history. So the timing of key life history events could be changing and the size and age of these fish populations could be changing. So the life histories themselves of these fish are going to be uh, responding to climate change. And the location of uh, salmon is shifting as well. And so some areas might contract, some areas might expand. And so, you know, when we, when we think about climate change, it is this real sort of complex problem where there are these multiple pathways and there are these multiple responses. So what I thought I'd do is just showcase a couple examples from my group about some of the manifestations of climate change. So first of all, you know, one of the questions that's really in, important is, is trying to understand, you know, on a local level, how is climate change shifting salmon productivity? And my group has had the fortune and privilege of working in the Nicola watershed with DFO and the province and First Nations and others thinking about these questions about how climate change through modifying and warming air temperatures as well as shifting precipitation from snow to rain could be increasing water temperatures and decreasing summer flows. And then trying to ask the question, well, what does this actually do to salmon populations. And in this case, we examine Chinook populations. And in this system, in the Nicola over the last hundred years, um, there has been a pretty pronounced decrease in the summer flows. So those flow regimes, the timing and the magnitude of when water comes down these rivers is changing. And as uh, Dr. Zweiers um, indicated, um, you know, the, the flow during the summer is decreasing. Flows are also changing in other times of the year, and you see also shifts in sort of the magnitude of events like floods. So that context in this system is, you know, on the ground measurements where the, the summer, the amount of water in the summer is now lower by over a third now compared to 100 years ago. And so what we we're interested in the question of, well, so this is a manifestation of climate change, a shift um, in summer flows. How does this actually affect um, salmon production, given ocean variability, given all these other factors. So what is the true relationship based on what the salmon are saying, based on their population's ups and downs between the amount of water in the river and, you know, the number of successful recruits to the next generation? So a master's student in my group, Luke Workentine, in collaboration with uh, DFO scientists, looked at this with a Bayesian life cycle model. And he basically asked the data, you know, what controls the number of recruits per spawner across different years. And the real powerful thing about this data is actually was there's index of marine survival as well. So we could 
include that in the model. And then we could ask those data, you know, what is the relationship between how much water there is in the summer and the whether the population is increasing or decreasing. And so those data are shown here. This is a paper that's in revision right now. And what it discovered is that, you know, perhaps not surprisingly, when there's more water in the river, the fish do better. Fish need water, I guess that shouldn't be surprising. But oftentimes the assumption is that this type of relationship saturates and that you know, at some point it doesn't matter, but that doesn't seem to be the case in this system. And importantly, what we also discovered that actually this low summer flow had more power in describing the population than actually marine, this index of marine survival. And so this, you know, the amount of flow in the system where the young, when the young salmon are rearing in the system really controls whether that population is decreasing when recruits per spawner is less than one, or whether it's increasing and can actually sustainably support fisheries, for example. And so climate change and the shifting flow regimes is decreasing this productivity, this population. And it's exciting to know that this, uh, this type of relationship is being fed into ongoing work in the Nicola by others in the collaborative um, processes being led by uh, the five tribes in the province. So that's you know, an example, and there's a lot of these examples out in the literature about the different ways that uh, the local manifestations of climate change are impacting salmon population abundance and productivity. But there's also potential that salmon life histories are being shifted by uh, climate change. And there's work around uh, the Pacific Rim about this. And I just wanted to showcase some work coming out of my group that's really that I'm excited about. So one of these key life history events that seems like it really is a, um, a critical part of the salmon life cycle is this period when salmon migrate from fresh waters out to the ocean. So here's a picture of some smolts from the Skeena, from, you know, probably from the Babine migrating on their way down to the estuary and out and beyond. And so the timing of this migration is thought to have evolved such that it occurs such that those fish are going to hit the ocean at a time that can maximize their survival because it coincides with their prey. So the timing of when their marine prey are blooming. And so whether or not that timing of that event changes is a real key indicator of whether you know, these life cycles are getting pushed around by climate change. And maybe that pushing is happening on the freshwater side as their growth rates are changing and they're responding plastically. Or maybe it's happening on the marine side. We don't know. But what we can say is if we you know, can look at to see when this change is happening and the rate of this change, it's a real sort of key uh, symptom of climate change that can you know, showcase uh, what's going on in the systems. And so work by PhD student Sam Wilson, who's actually defending on Monday, yay Sam, um, did a remarkable job at looking at this. And so she compiled an unprecedented data set of the timing of salmon smolt out migrations from Alaska down to Washington and California and BC and in between. And this is a map of those systems, the different colors show uh, different pop, different, uh, uh, sorry, different species of salmon. And um, these data set are all 20 years or more of wild stocks that looked at, you know, the timing of when young salmon go to the sea. And working with diverse collaborators, you know, the people who have been on the ground, boots wet, you know, collecting this data year after year after year. And this is hard data. This is like getting up early in the morning every day during smolt season. Um, and so, you know, in these systems with these diverse collaborators, Sam has discovered that there are these patterns that do seem like they are varying across species. And so the plot to the left showcases the sort of average trends across all these systems, across these years and years of data. And what she discovered is that some um, species, namely pink and chum, seem like they're getting earlier. And so as the world warms, as the ocean food webs shift in their timing, as fresh waters change, um, you know, pink and chum salmon are leaving earlier. But then the other species seems like they're changing, you know, not as consistently. So there are some species level trends in the responses of salmon smolt to phenology and other co concurrent changes in these systems. But what I thought was really even more remarkable was how much variability there was on the local level. So I know there's a ton of data here, but what this shows is the change in 
timing over time. So anything to the left of that dashed line means that migration is getting earlier. To the right means it's getting later. So as we just discovered, just discovered and talked about, in some of these um, populations and species, in general, things are getting earlier. That's what you might predict with climate change. But crazy variability and really unpredictable, unpredictable variability. Sam looked at a bunch of different potential factors that might explain whether a population is getting later or earlier, and nothing really popped out. You know, it wasn't watershed size, it wasn't latitude, nothing really popped out. And so, you know, maybe this unpredictability is a key sort of message that we should be thinking about with climate change. Maybe the fact that salmon are so diverse, that watersheds are so complex, that the actual local manifestations of climate change, we don't really know exactly what's going to happen, means that on a local level, the responses of salmon might be unpredictable. Okay, so phenology is changing. It's changing different ways. These life histories are changing and changing different different ways, but, but does it matter? And so a paper that just came out actually last week was led by Sam as well. And this was digging into one of these amazing data sets down in Washington and working with colleagues down there. Um, she analyzed the probability that individual young steelhead would survive the ocean. And so these are tagged fish. And then she looked at what the probability of survival was for each individual fish. And what she discovered is that the condition of these uh, young fish as they leave fresh water really controls their marine survival. And so this shows the timing of outmigration and then the survival probability as a function of that for different sizes of fish. So bigger smolts survived better, but then also the smolts that um, left the river at the right time um, survive better as well. And this isn't shown here, but she also discovered that that optimal timing varied by year to year. And so I think this is important for several reasons. First of all, it showcases that when we think about marine survival, you know, it's not happening in a bubble. What's actually potentially setting the stage for this is carryover effects from freshwater conditions. And so marine survival is you know, hugely important in salmon life cycle. And this paper demonstrates that what happens in fresh water, the freshwater conditions that control the timing, the size of those outmigration salmon, salmon can really control that marine survival. And so again, you know, salmon life cycles integrate across these ecosystems and we should be considering these um, connections when we think about climate change. And I think the second key take home is the fact that, that you know, there is this variability in when it is optimal to go out. And so, you know, presumably salmon have evolved due to the historic timing of marine prey. And as that marine prey shifts with climate change, having a diversity of life history timings might be really important in buffering the populations from this change. The next deck that Sam's doing after she graduates, and I'm really excited that she's going to keep working uh, with the Salmon Watersheds Lab, is she's going to be continuing to build these data sets with these big partners, bringing these data together to assess changing salmon life histories, to really sort of, uh, you know, do this assessment of how are these life cycles changing and trying to pull the different stages of life cycles together as well. And this is a picture showing uh, some of our health, health sick colleagues that we work with up on the central coast in a um, small trap that we uh, run with them up there to understand sockeye and coho populations. So I'm going to transition now to thinking about sort of the risks. And I want to highlight that, you know, that previous section on climate change impacts, there's a ton of amazing work out there. And so that was just showcasing a couple examples, trying to highlight, you know, the local realities and complexities of climate change as some of our work is found. So when we think about risk, and Sue talked about this, um, I really find the, the sort of general risk framework super helpful. In general, you know, the risk of um, something bad happening is a function of sort of three main things. It's the product of the exposure of that, of the, you know, the population of that risk, and then the sensitivity of that population minus the adaptation or the mitigation. And so we can plot that here on the sort of miss risk, uh, you know, heat map, where if you have high exposure and high sensitivity, your risk is going to be high. Whereas if you have low of either, it gets less. And then, you know, if you have low of both, it's really low risk. 
And so it's fun to sort of try to decompose these components. And so if we think about the exposure of different salmon populations to climate change, and I mean, maybe let's, just, let's simplify this a little bit to thinking about warming water temperatures in uh, freshwater systems. Um, you know, I think it's really key to think about how the, both the life histories and the locations of these populations will really drive that exposure. And um, I just want to showcase some work by Anna Potapova, who's a master's student in my group, who's looking at this exposure of different populations to warming water temperatures. And so what she's done is she's compiled this amazing data set on Chinook salmon run timing diversity from Alaska all the way down to California. And so plot that is plotted here. So this is a map showing all the different populations for which she has adult run timing data. This is the time of year when they go up the river. And it's plotted from the far north down to you know, Sacramento River system in California. And to me, you know, this really, I love this graph. This is one of my favorite graphs. Um, what it shows is you know, remarkable diversity across different populations of sockeye, sorry, of Chinook salmon. You know, the hundreds of populations. And you know, really importantly, also, you know, huge variation as you go from the north to the south. And in the north, though, that runtime is pretty constrained, actually, in systems like the Yukon or farther north, Kuskokwim, you know, there's only, you know, a month or so when adult salmon are migrating up, upstream. But as you go south, that runtime in diversity gets broader and broader. There's probably less constraints, actually, by cold water temperatures for that migration. And then as you get farther south, what you see is this really amazing sort of spreading of the run timing. And so that populations aren't migrating during the hot summer when the water temperatures are too hot for the fish. Adaptation and evolution has driven it such that there's you know, spring run fish that are migrating early on and then they go up high into the headwaters and then hold in cold thermal refuges. And there's also fall run fish, but there's nothing in the middle or very little in the middle. And then systems like the Fraser are kind of in between. And so to me, you know, this really showcases sort of three things, I guess. First of all, you can imagine that um, if we map out water temperatures across this, what we see is that, you know, it's colder farther north and it's hotter farther south. But run timing is huge in terms of determining whether or not a population is hitting hot water or not. Many of these populations are migrating during certain times of year when it might not be hot at all. And so I think this is really amazing data to showcase how that sort of run timing diversity controls thermal um, exposure as well as the actual sort of thermal landscapes. And I also think it's really interesting to think about this in terms of how the regions to the south might be what we would expect salmon to try to evolve to over time if given the opportunity as water temperatures warm. And so thinking about sort of the climate futures of salmon life histories. The next component of risk is thinking about the sensitivity of these populations. And this is something that I feel like we actually don't know a ton about. There's some amazing data from Erica Eliasson and others on how different sockeye salmon populations within the Fraser, for example, have different local adaptations to different temperatures. And so some populations actually you know, can deal with warm water pretty well, whereas others are quite sensitive. And I think, you know, again, this might be sort of on the forefront of the science. We really don't know this for most species and most populations. And so in some cases, I think there are probably cross-cutting limits to what salmon can withstand. But in some cases, there's probably high levels of local adaptation. And then, you know, the, the next component of this risk framework is thinking about the adaptation and the mitigation. And how will salmon cope with this challenge? Will southern populations move north? Or will the local adaptation, local populations rapidly evolve? Or will these populations shift in terms of their run timing? They'll hold off the rivers until the river cools more. So all three of these things are probably happening, but I don't think we have a great handle on where and when and the rates of this. And you know, I think it's really a key unknown as to whether salmon can keep up with climate change, whether their adaptive capacity can cope with what's happening. 
And all this can get put together in climate risk assessments. And it's exciting to hear more about what Sue Grant and others are doing at DFO and thinking about climate risk assessments and vulnerability assessments in BC. And uh, the States has done great work. So Lisa Crozier, for example, has this amazing paper where she looked at climate vulnerability assessment for uh, Pacific salmon in the lower 48 states, putting, you know, using expert opinion as well as data to put uh, salmon to this risk framework to understand, you know, what's the reality or what's the sort of anticipated challenge of climate change. All right, I'm going to transition to thinking about change in complex systems. So I guess one of the things that really um, I think a lot about is I think about how these watersheds are these amazing complex systems where flows of water and flows of sediment and migrations of fish and the behavior of people connect these systems. And you know what, what happens in one component of the watershed or one component of the system is going to affect the other systems. And when we have climate change being this big perturbation, you know, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a complex problem. And one of the realities of these systems is that they're not going to change linearly. They're, the states of them are going to change. And so, for example, uh, you know, systems that have glaciers are going to no longer have that ice. You know, this, the water changes from solid to liquid, and that's going to be a fundamental transformation of these salmon systems. And here's a, one of these pictures that shows what's been happening in some of these systems. So a PhD student in my group who recently graduated, Kara Pittman, uh, looked at this a little bit. And what she, um, she and a diverse set of uh, collaborators that range from glacier experts to climate scientists to salmon squeezers like myself, um, you know, we brought together those lines of thinking to come up with some predictions about how salmon populations might respond as glaciers retreat. And what, you know, it's not surprising, but what we're predicting is that as glaciers march up the mountains, they'll, um, you know, leave habitat behind. And science is finding that those habitats are rapidly getting colonized by thousands of salmon and those populations are flourishing in these newly deglaciated systems. But, you know, in other systems where the glaciers are lost completely, that loss is, is going to lose the cold water that might help salmon flourish. And what she's actually done is she's actually mapped out where future rivers for salmon will be as the um, rivers uh, sorry, as the rivers sort of go upstream as the glaciers retreat. And not surprisingly, these, these new rivers are mostly where there's the most ice. So in southern Alaska, some of the transboundary regions as well. But in total, we estimate that there's going to be thousands of kilometers of new rivers for salmon over the next hundred years in these areas. In other places, glacier loss is going to pose challenges. But in these places, uh, you know, salmon will have new habitats that they could flourish in if they are given the opportunity. And I think, you know, one of the key questions is, will they be given the opportunity? Because these places are not only frontiers for salmon, but they're also frontiers for mining. And so as these glaciers are going up these valleys, the mining claims are, you know, happening as well. In eight years of glacier retreat, at this rate it's been going, there could be an ore body sticking right out of the ground that nobody's ever seen before. And so this area is sort of known as the Golden Triangle, the Golden, Ho Golden Horseshoe. And I think it, you know, it's going to be a really key question as to whether decide, it, you know, society decides um, whether this is a place that's a frontier for salmon or a frontier for mining. I think another transformation that's also going to happen in these salmon systems is sea level rise in estuaries. As we've discussed, I think this sort of estuary part of the salmon life cycle is a little bit underappreciated, and some of the work that we've been doing really highlights how you know these nursery habitats could really be key parts of the salmon life cycle and help connect fresh waters to the ocean as salmon make that difficult journey out. And so, um, you know, if we think about the stage of the life cycle, uh, you know, it's pretty critical to think about how it's going to change with climate change. And I'm really excited to be a part of a project led by uh, Nature Trust British Columbia. It's a BC Shrift project. And what this project is doing is it's looking at estuaries up and down the coast of BC and then looking at sea level rise and trying to ask the question of well, what can we do about it? Where will there be opportunities for restoration of these systems? So in this picture here, East Coast Vancouver Island, we have an estuary. But we, you know, they're, they're forecasting in some of these systems 50 centimeters to over a meter of sea level rise over the next century. That's a lot of marsh habitat that will be underwater and gone unless that marsh 
that marsh can march up the slope. And in this watershed, what you can see is that in some places, there will be opportunities for that marsh to go upstream. But in other places, due to dikes, there won't. And so there could be strategic acquisitions or on the ground restoration activities that could help really inform the, res the resilience of these systems to sea level rise. And I encourage you to check out this, uh, this website if you are interested in learning more about this project. And so what we're doing is we're putting the salmon lens on this, and this is being led by Julie and Gann and my group. And we're excited to be doing some field work this summer, hopefully, on this topic. But across these two examples, I think it really highlights the complexity of change in these complex systems, how it's not necessarily going to be linear increases in temperature, but there are going to be these state changes. You know, what used to be estuary will now be ocean. What used to be ice might now be water. And I think this is really, there's a real key need and opportunity for science to inform the conservation of not just the current habitat of salmon, but also the future habitat of salmon. Another, I think, reality of climate change in these systems is that these systems are working watersheds. You know, there's a lot of different resource extraction that happens in them. And I think we're oftentimes quite quick to sort of say, oh, it's climate change, we can't do anything about it. But the reality is, it, you know, in this example that I gave before, yes, climate change is going to be changing snow to rain. And yes, that change is going to decrease summer flows. But the reality is that there's a host of cumulative effects in these systems that could also be influencing these master variables in these ecosystems. And so in particular, in the Nicola, for example, there's a lot of logging and there's also a lot of water withdrawals. And both those processes have been shown to warm water temperatures and decrease summer flows. And so frankly, we don't exactly know what the role of climate change is versus watershed land use activities. And I think we need to be quite cautious when we're sort of ascribing change to climate change because the reality is that our actions on the land could all be driving those patterns or at least contributing to those patterns. For example, in this area, you know, over the last several decades, there's been over 20% of that watershed clear cut and you know the water allocations continue to go up and so previously i sort of framed this under climate change but frankly it's a it's you know climate change lens but it's actually a cumulative effects lens and i think that cumulative effects lens is super important for us to be thinking about because i think there's a lot actually on the ground that we can do that can help sort of at least mitigate some of the impacts of climate change And this is just a, um, a GIF of change in the system where there's this in threatened salmon population that's decreasing due to flow. And what we see is this rapid expansion of logging. And logging has been you know, found to decades after the cuts have happened to dramatically decrease summer flows in systems. And so I'm excited to be part of a project supported by DFO. Um, we're calling it the Watershed Futures Initiative. And the goal is to improve the state of knowledge and the effective management of cumulative effects. And um, yeah, it's an exciting initiative and it's got some great partners working with lots of different groups. Another reality of these complex systems is that they have crazy diversity. And so even within BC alone, you know, you have salmon populations that are in coastal rainforests that get, you know, probably what is it, many, many meters of rain each year. And then you also have salmon in desert systems that are, you know, have cactus in them. And these systems are going to respond very differently to climate change. And then on top of that climactic diversity and watershed diversity, you have layers of diversity from salmon. And so you have different adaptations, different traits that are mapping out differently across these landscapes. And these different populations have different genetics. And so across BC and the hundreds of different locally adapted salmon populations with their genetics, you know, these are all potential puzzle pieces to the climate change challenge that's coming. But I don't think we really know which puzzle piece is going to work. I don't think we know that. I think what we could say, though, is that if we preserve more puzzle pieces, we have a greater likelihood of having a solution to this challenge.
And these systems are dynamic. And so one of the places I'm excited to work is up in the Taku in the north. And this is a you know, GIF showing this river migrating back and forth. And so as this flow regime changes, as the glaciers retreat, you know, these rivers are going to evolve. And so what we know now is not going to be what is happening in the future. And these changes are going to be sort of linear, but they're also going to be, you know, unpredictable. And so in the Taku as well, just this last year, there was a massive landslide. And here's a picture taken before and after where the mountain basically fell into the river. And this is thought to be caused by melting permafrost. And where the river used to be is now under a massive tailings from this huge slide that happened. And so these natural hazards are going to be things that challenge our ability to sort of predict climate change in these, um, in these really complex salmon systems. And so you have these layers of change. And then, of course, fish are going to add another layer. They're not only diverse, but they can move. And so across vast river networks, fish will move to take advantage of places that they can flourish in. And there's a great new paper by Johnny Armstrong out of Oregon State University. And what he did is he highlighted in this large Oregon drainage how even when the summer gets too hot in this river, as shown by the blue area and the main stem, um, where the growth potential is actually negative because it's so hot that those fish will be basically like cooking. Um, that same area will be where most of the growth can happen during the autumn and the spring. And so fish will move across these vast areas. And it's really important that we don't sort of write off habitats too early and we think about the systems across time and space. And collectively, when we think about complex systems, it's really important to remember that, you know, the, the product is more than the pieces. The sum is greater than the parts. And I think that's true for climate change as well. I think the resilience of these systems, if these pieces are kept together, will be greater than the pieces apart. So today what I did is I, I talked about these three things. And I you know, know it was a little bit across the board and, and touched on a lot of different topics, but I thought I'd just sort of share some of my thinking, talking about climate change impacts, climate risk, climate change, and complex systems. And so climate change is here, and I think there's a real urgent opportunity um, for science and collaboration to help figure out what we can do about it. And I think that science is really key to help sort of identifying the tangible management levers, the tangible actions that we can take for trying to move towards systems that will be resilient towards climate change. And if I can just sort of go out on a limb, I'm going to suggest three things that we could think about. And these are sort of personal opinions. One is I think, you know, when we think about climate change, we can't ignore the global fact of climate change. And Canada has an opportunity to take a leadership role in climate change. The second point is that as these salmon populations are shifting in unpredictably ways and their productivity is changing, I think there's a real urgent need to re-envision salmon fisheries. The big mixed stock fisheries of the past might not be viable in this era of unpredictability. And I think there's a real need for fisheries to get re-envisioned that maintain the cultural connections that salmon have provided for millennia. Third, I think there's an urgent need for the collaborative stewardship of salmon watersheds. And I think this type of approach needs to tackle hard questions like, could the timber industry be managed differently so that it doesn't magnify the impacts of climate change, but could even potentially mitigate some of the local impacts. And uh, yeah, I just am excited about these conversations and I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you all. And I just wanted to end by thanking the team that makes all this work possible within my group, as well as the broader network of supporters that we have the privilege to work with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan. I appreciate that. Very interesting. Uh, multifaceted. It's, it's all over. That's amazing stuff. So I'm going to look to the Slido now to see if folks have questions for Dr. Moore uh, based on the presentation. We'll give him a few seconds. Uh, it's a post-lunch thing. I know. <laughs> Good to see you, Marcel. It's been a while. It has. Good to see you as well. Somebody described this uh, time slot for talks as the slot of death, the sort of po post-lunch nap time, siesta time. I would look to Jason. Jason, um, any thoughts on Jonathan's presentation uh, from the PSF perspective? Uh, 
Hello, is anybody out there? Give them a shout and tell them to hang on for a minute. Okay. Oh. oh, can you guys hear me now? We can hear you good, Jay. Oh, good. Sorry, I killed the battery on my uh, on my mic or something, so that the support crew here were rapidly trying to fix me up. Uh, yeah, Marcel, we don't have any questions in the Slido yet. I would encourage people to do so. I've got a, a million on my notepad here, so I'll take a host prerogative, John. Uh, I'll start with uh, maybe an opportunity uh, for you to share with the, the folks here. What is involved in the Watershed Futures Initiative that you touched on? Yeah, thank you. Um, so the Watershed Initiatives is really thinking about the cumulative effects of different land use activities as well as climate change on salmon watersheds. And if we think about these cumulative effects, you know, we're trying to do three main things, I guess. First, we're trying to tackle some of the key unknowns. Um, we're gonna do a series of studies that relate some of those key linkages between some of the key activities, like such as logging and how it affects the things like flows and temperatures and ultimately salmon. So we're gonna plug in some science to try to feed some of those gaps with on the ground work as well as syntheses of the massive amounts of data on, that has been done to date on these topics. Secondly, we really wanna provide a platform for sort of elevating the work of all the amazing people that do work on cumulative effects is such a diverse and big topic. And so um, we've had one webinar and we're hoping to do more that really sort of tries to you know, elevate the work of others. And um, I encourage people to check out that website. I'll provide a link if I can and follow up materials. But I think it's watershedfutures.com but um, we'll have a mailing list that we're going to launch soon as well to try to share the information and share the tools. And ultimately what we're hoping to do is be able to, you know, provide a platform for bringing science to bear to explore positive scenarios for watersheds, be able to work with different communities to sort of turn the dial and ask, well, what might happen if we did this? What might happen if we did this restoration activity or what might happen if, um, you know, logging industry was modified in this way. And I think this can work really well with some of the ongoing initiatives, such as the province's data or the PSF's, PSF's data that's sort of compiled the data on the state of the system. And then we're trying to use that as a backbone for forward-looking, um, you know, scenario planning type of exercises. Well, uh, thank you for that. Uh, while you were responding to me, we've had a few questions come in on the Slido now. Um, can we put those up so John and Marcel can see them? I'm just uh, loading them in on my side here. Stacy Larson, she asks, could you give an example of a forestry practice that would be helpful? Well, I think um, when I was sort of talking about the sort of mitigation of climate change with forestry, I guess what I was trying to think through is how the current practices could be changed so that they're not, you know, no longer um, mitigating or sort of magnifying the effects of climate change. I think there are really important things that could be done, such as replanting um, more diverse assemblages of trees that aren't as sort of vulnerable to large scale forest fires would be one example. I think sort of larger setbacks is another example of, you know, something that would be, um, you know, potentially helpful in some areas. Thank you. Uh, Wayne Solowski, headwater storage and deeper stream overwintering habitat in our upper Nechaco streams are becoming critical. Building a resilient forest around these streams that include opportunities for beavers to thrive, to thrive in are going to be critical in our region. Great presentation. Thank you for that, Wayne. And then Cam Freshwater asks great talk jonathan wondering if you can provide thoughts on how we can better manage with regards to the carryover effects you described many of these seem outside of our control except maybe in hatchery systems where we can control air quotes things like small size and out migrating timing yeah that's a great question cam um i'm sure you've thought about this as well quite a bit so yeah, as Cam mentioned, these carryover effects are was what happens in one stage affects the other. And so the sort of state of the fish as it leaves fresh water would affect its ocean survival. I think, um, you know, perhaps what I'm coming to with that question is perhaps not necessarily a direct thing that we try to sort of manage and prescribe for, but rather I think the, the appreciation for those connections really sort of 
increases the potential levers for us in general. And so I think the idea that marine survival isn't just out of our hands, but actually could be you know, influenced by the health of the system, the watershed, I think is a key realization. I think that in itself, um, you know, even if it isn't a, you know, a tight lever, it does highlight those connections and does sort of place priority um, or emphasis on the freshwater system. Um, yeah, so I guess that's my sort of general answer. I guess I don't think we're there yet in terms of being able to tweak the system and carefully control it. So should we have sort of the optimal smolt? I think preserving the diversity of these systems is probably the key um, in that case. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, another question from Anonymous. Can you provide examples of what re-envisioning of fisheries would look like? How can science inform and encourage the federal government to move in this direction? For example, what are the pathways for management slash policy okay, if we go over time on this. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and so one of the, I'd like to, um, there's a paper we actually just published led by a former PhD student, Will Atlas, in collaboration with Indigenous leaders from throughout BC. And what we did there is we actually looked at, um, you know, some of the different management systems and salmon fishery systems that have been done in the past, as well as, you know, some day, some places current day. And I think, you know, looking to the past might offer some of these potential solutions where then instead of sort of large scale mixed stock fisheries, there might be more opportunities for sort of more terminal fisheries that use more diverse methods that simultaneously advance and revitalize cultural practices. And so that's one, you know, I think real opportunities. And there's a ton of examples that are emerging from different First Nations communities from throughout the province, where whether it's, um, you know, a weir in the Quay system in the Central Coast that the Heltzik are working on, whether it's a fish trap in the Lower Skeena, the La Colombes is advancing, or this Lake Babine Nation's terminal fishery. I think there's a series of these examples that can provide real sort of foundations for fisheries that can be more place-based, more sort of tied into the local abundance, and, and thus more resilient. And so I think it's really sort of intertwined with reconciliation and sort of advancing um, indigenous co-governance of these systems. Thanks again. So Mark, Mark Saunders asks, do you see a life cycle modeling approach that might be able to synthesize cumulative effects end to end? Yeah, I think at the heart of thinking about cumulative effects is a life cycle model. And so we've been collaboration, collaborating with um, Isabel Pearsall and um, DFO and others on, you know, thinking about the RAMS process in particular. And that's been um, launched in a couple of different systems. And I think what we're hoping to do is have that life cycle be the foundation, but then also link it to the land use and have it to use forward working perspective. Thank you. Richard Bailey asks, cumulative effects, can, can we use the results of those studies to parameterize forward-looking modeling to better plan land and water use to get watersheds to a future place that supports salmon again? Yeah, I think Richard, you answered your question. I think that's exactly right. What we're hoping to do in this Watershed Futures Initiative is to have these science-based planning scenarios where we can, you know, basically chart forward paths for thriving salmon watersheds, or at least salmon watersheds that might be more resilient to climate change through different water uses, through different land management systems. Sam James, I'm curious to know more about how we can use science to inform management strategies. You showed several amazing figures of shifting phenology, spatial and adaptation to river temperatures in terms of run timing. How can management support salmon adaptation to match the pace of environmental change? Yeah, that's a great question, Sam. Um, a couple of thoughts. One is I think, um, you know, in some of these systems, we might get a, be able to get a sense for which, which salmon populations are really going to be in trouble and which salmon populations might be able to keep pace. And so that's, I think, maybe what we can get to, and that might help us allow to sort of prioritize, um, you know, populations for conservation. I think, um, you know, to be honest, I oftentimes come back to diversity. And I think, you know, the unpredictability of some of these systems is something that I struggle with. And so when we think about systems that are unpredictable, I do come back to the fact that, 
you know, preserving the pieces and trying to maybe, you know, allow a fish, as many fish back that really have more of that sort of genetic diversity to thrive in. And I know that DFO is doing great work on this as well, thinking about, you know, the climate, climate adaptability of different populations. Um, so I think there's some really exciting opportunities um, that can link the sort of life histories, the genetics to the sort of state change. Thanks, uh, John. Here's another one, Jacques White. Excellent presentation. What do you think is the sensitivity of the analysis of change in migration timing for the different species? Uh, that is, is a two-day change in peak for migration per decade a real and meaningful result, or is the threshold five days per decade, or et cetera? Well, I think... Um... And I'm going to sort of fold the next question from Jacques White, and that is, you know, is it dependent on the variability and the sort of magnitude of the changing? And so what I will say is we use state-of-the-art, um, you know, Bayesian models to sort of incorporate the variability in the estimates and then propagated that out into the estimates of the rates of change. And so those, you know, those um, distributions of the estimates of change are sort of fully accounting for the variation, both in terms of the observation as well as within the population. In terms of what's sort of real and meaningful, I think, um, you know, it's a, a bit of a harder question. I think, um, you know, what we can say is what the reality is on the ground in terms of the change. And so the systems are changing. Some of those changes, the average is quite significantly different than zero. Other species have ranges where the average is not different than zero, but then individual populations might be increasing or decreasing. And so it's a story of complexity. It's a story where some of them, we can't say whether there's been a, a significant trend through time. Others, we can say they're advancing, others decreasing, and we've quantified the variation. Okay, thank you. Aaron Hill asks, or a great presentation and recommendations, John. Given the rapid adaptation that is required for salmon to survive these rapid changes in cumulative effects, what are your thoughts on how hatcheries fit in and what questions we should be asking about our use of hatcheries in the era of climate change? Yeah, that's a great question, Aaron. I think one of the, um, so one of the things that really alarms me, to be honest, about hatcheries is that some of the evidence has found that they can erode the local diversity of salmon populations. And there was a study down in, down in California where they looked at historical genetics of steelhead and then compared those to modern genetics of steelhead. And what they found is that, you know, it used to be that the more distant populations were more distantly related. That's what you'd expect. You know, there's local adaptation, but that no longer is there over, you know, over roughly a centuries of habit change as well as pervasive habitat, I'm sorry, hatchery use. And so to be honest, I have real concerns about the potential risks of hatcheries in terms of eroding the wild salmon diversity that is providing that sort of diverse puzzle pieces or the sort of potential solutions in the future. I think there is a real sort of key role of hatcheries, you know, working with communities, providing local opportunities for fisheries. But I do have real concerns about the, um, the sort of long-term effects of hatcheries on the resilience of salmon. And also say that you know, there is evidence of ocean competition. And, you know, if we look at the signals that are shown in the abundance of salmon populations, um, you know, when there's more pink salmon in the ocean, sockeye do worse. And, you know, a lot of those pink salmon are coming from hatcheries, not necessarily in BC. Um, but I think, you know, the signals of competition are there as well. And so hatcheries do have match, you know, multiple pathways of risks to wild stocks. Thank you. ECA is most often attributed to changes in timing, magnitude of peak flows. We see that a more potentially impactful result from shifting forest ages, where my age class to younger forest is their effect on drawing down the water table and magnifying summertime low flows. Do your models consider this? Yeah, thanks, Lars. So. Um, yeah, to be clear, um, I was referring to Rita Winkler's work in terms of showing that drawdown effect. And so I think we're on the same page about that. And so for the broader audience, um, you know, one of the key findings that's come from really great work coming out of the province is that, you know, if a system is clear cut and then there's that regrowth, that regrowth, all those young trees actually suck up the water 
And so that it has a sort of delayed um, but long lasting decrease in low summer flows. Um, and I think I might have lost the second part of the question. Oh yeah, the models. Uh, we're still developing those, so it'd be great to talk more about, about those. But yeah, I think there's a lot of really important opportunities, including some sort of nuanced reality about sort of timber management in those. Okay, so I'm recognizing time. Now you've been a great uh, uh, presenter. I'm going to give another five minutes here. We've got two or three more questions, and then we'll probably try to wrap it up because we do need to get to the Slido questions we're after. So next one from Greg Knox. The province makes most of the decisions that impact freshwater habitats, yet they have very little focus on salmon. Do you have any thoughts on how the province can start to integrate salmon habitat CE information into their decision making? Yeah, thanks, Greg. So, um, so the province has really done some really exciting work where they've done mapping and bringing together the data that sort of um, puts together estimates of the state of different areas. And so they've done different cumulative effects processes where they, you know, will, for example, quantify the road density in different areas. And as Greg alludes to, this doesn't feed directly into decision making in terms of projects. And so I think that's where there's a real need um, for DFO and the province to sort of sync themselves up together. As part of our watershed futures initiative, you know, one of the things that was really kind of an interesting reality check for me is trying to sort of think through the need for keeping salmon from falling between the regulatory cracks of DFO in the province. And I think there's sort of a real need and opportunity to connect those pieces. And so, you know, I think DFO is working on it from their end as well. Um, where, you know, revisions to the Fisheries Act is now including cumulative effects. And I think there's, you know, I think there's a lot of, um, there's some momentum for increasing the accountability and trying to sort of keep these systems from falling between the cracks. But I do think there's, you know, work to be done in terms of the governance and sort of legal policy side of things. Okay, thank you. Um, Bruce Runciman asks, in context of time-sensitive conservation challenges, diverse conditions across BC and Yukon, limited resources, engagement and coordination across levels of government and stakeholders. What do you recommend as a first priority towards improving freshwater habitat conditions for salmon? Just that, huh? That's a hard one. <laughs> <laughs> a couple things, I guess, come to mind. One is I think connectivity is a, a key thing. And if you reconnect systems, salmon will find it. And I think there has been some work on this, but I, I guess I'd sort of recommend that is, you know, one easy, fast win. Reconnecting systems that are, um, you know, broken by faulty culverts or, you know, dikes that don't have fish passage through them, or, um, you know, if there's impassable dams, you know, that'll have huge dividends quickly. Um, Yeah, I, th I think there's, your point's really important, Bruce, and I'm, I'm frankly at a loss. There's a lot to do, and I don't exactly know how to prioritize them personally. Um, so I'm going to sort of push that question, but just highlight that it's important, and maybe this is something that the group can tackle such that we're all sort of on the page and, and can work forward, you know, really efficiently and, and quickly to tackle things um, in a time-sensitive manner. Nice. It's kind of setting the stage for future workshops. I hope my uh, planning committee is listening to that. That's good. All right. Brian asks, great overview, John. Thanks. I was very glad to hear your inclusion of estuaries and sea level rise. But the biggest issue is immediately outside us, the Fraser Estuary. Any thoughts on how to address such a stressed environment and critical habitat? Yeah. So I think one of the things that the Fraser River estuaries, and this is a broad point, that I'll make is that I think, you know, it's harder to restore than to protect. And so once, you know, you have humanity sort of entrained in the area, it's hard to sort of claw back the salmon system. And so I think, you know, being a little bit proactive is first of all, a, overall would be a good strategy. But yeah, the reality is the Fraser is the most important salmon system in BC and it's in our backyard where most of BC lives. And so it is a big problem. You know, it does seem like there's some major projects that are getting proposed for the Fraser. And so it seems like the Fraser of Estuary. And so those should get you know, really careful review 
And given the thinking about climate change, given the importance of estuaries for salmon, because that's one point, there are tangible activities on the ground that could ha happen now that would improve habitat. And I'm thinking about um, you know, the flood boxes that block fish in you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of tributaries and off channels throughout the lower Fraser. And that's a project that um, Watch and Watch Salmon Society and Rain Coast is involved with, as well as many others. Um, and then I think there's creative work in thinking about whether there can be, um, you know, some solutions or some ways to mitigate changing habitats, whether it's sort of allowing the marsh to expand or sort of thinking about where the sediment's getting deposited and allow that system to try to keep up with some of the climate change. But I agree, Brian, I think it's a huge challenge. Okay, I think we have time for these last two questions, but that is it. So Rupert Gale asks, stream type Chinook have been impacted to a greater extent than ocean type. Is there any evidence that Chinook may adapt their life history to more ocean type to avoid exposure to poor freshwater conditions? Yeah, that's a great question. I think, um, you know, this question is really sort of linked to whether that trait is hardwired or not. And I think sort of two things could happen. One thing is that there could be a shift in the types of populations that thrive. And so that probably is already happening, such that the ocean type populations seem like they're thriving more. And so their abundance won't be going down as much and might be increasing. And so I think there will be that sort of shift in different populations that are sort of linked to those different life histories. And that'll sort of manifest across space. And I think what you might be getting at is whether, um, you know, within a given population that used to be predominantly stream type, whether they could shift um, to be ocean type and I don't know that that's the case. I think there's some populations that are kind of in the middle that have sort of a messy mix of different population or different sort of uh, life histories. And those ones seem like the ones that might be able to transition or evolve if the pace isn't too bad and if the selection pressure matches up with the sort of genetic diversity. But I think the populations that are sort of hardwired stream type, I don't think they could shift. Okay, and the final question from Ben Sutherland, inspiring seminar, John, the puzzle piece analogy, what would you say are the most important salmon phenotypes to focus on in terms of future adaptation to climate change in salmon species, for example, sockeye or chinook? And which species are most likely impacted by climate change or respond to mitigation? Yeah, I thought Sue Grant puts forth some really good hypotheses about the different species and their sort of vulnerabilities to climate change. I thought her ideas that, um, you know, the species that have really tight local adaptations, such as sockeye, might have additional challenges. Um, and, and also species that have longer freshwater residency might have sort of additional places where climate change could hurt them. And so I think that idea, you know, resonates with me. I don't think we exactly know. In terms of the most important salmon phenotypes, I, I kind of, um, you know, I think we should be thinking about who are the colonizers and who who's going to sort of really provide the future. And so for sockeye salmon, is it the river type sockeye that are going to thrive in places where there's new, you know, new rivers from glacier retreat, um, you know, in, um, as you know, the Chinook populations evolve or as the sort of changing the, uh, the opportunities for different run timings evolve, we should maybe look to the South in terms of you know, what populations do well in rivers that are warmer than what we see now, but what our rivers are gonna be coming. And so I think looking you know, around for those types of things, it's a nebulous answer, but it's, I think it's a hard question. And again, I'll just sort of caution, I, I, I think we need to walk this line where we don't, we're not going to be able to predict all these things. We're not going to be able to predict exactly who thrives. We're not going to be able to predict exactly who's going to lose. We're going to be surprised a lot. And this, of course, conflicts a little bit with the real need for prioritization. And so I think we're going to need to sort of balance those two ideas. We need to balance the idea that there's unpredictability and there's value and diversity with the need for prioritization. And I think there's probably a sweet spot in the middle there. <laughs>